Yeah, it's just amazing what the Lord can do. You know, he sees a lost soul uh, who is seeking him and he sends somebody along uh, to meet that man. It's just, just amazing, yeah. Very encouraged by that. But uh, we'll have a look at a couple of verses here in Matthew chapter 11 and we'll see what Jesus says here. Then we'll look at the context and uh, get into the scriptures surrounding these verses. Look at Matthew chapter 11 and look at verse 28. The Bible says, and Jesus says here, Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's just pray one more time. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for our Saviour. We're thankful for the words uh, that we can read uh, that he said, Heavenly Father. And uh, Lord, we can learn uh, from our Saviour uh, when we are yoked together with him, Heavenly Father. And we take his yoke upon us, uh, Heavenly Father. We're so grateful for uh, the scriptures uh, that teach us, Heavenly Father. Help me uh, with my words, with my mind, as I declare your word. And uh, help us as a congregation, Heavenly Father, to retain these uh, scriptures, Lord, and uh, that we can grow thereby. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So here we've got a uh, very familiar passage of scripture. You know, it's, a, it's a wonderful invitation uh, from Jesus to the one who is weighed down uh, with labour and heavy laden uh, to come to him for rest. But the rest that Jesus is speaking about in this passage, it's just not any ordinary rest. Uh, we see it there in verse 29. Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Jesus is speaking uh, about a soul rest. Uh, he's not talking about a physical rest. Jesus says to take my yoke upon you. He says, for I am meek and lowly in heart. He says, learn of me. This is how you find rest unto your souls. What does it mean to take Jesus' yoke upon yourself and learn of him? So a yoke is a wooden bar or a frame which goes, after two, uh, goes over the neck of two draft animals, uh, such as uh, oxen. And they are joined at the, the heads or the necks and uh, they're working together. You know, one, once joined or yoked up together, the oxen uh, work together to plough a field or, or drag a cart or where, whatever it is that they're yoked up together to do. And, uh, you know, if a, a new ox is added, if an ox dies or, uh, you know, uh, they've, they've got to get a new ox in, um, it's yoked up together with the old ox and uh, it's got to learn from the old ox. The new ox uh, has to learn uh, how to... Uh, be under the yoke and how to plough the field. So when you think of being yoked up, it generally means partnered up uh, for a task or to carry a burden you know, or a weight. You know. But being yoked up with Jesus is going to be very different than being yoked up with anybody else. And uh, when you've got uh, two oxen yoked up together, you can't have, in, have one wanting to go right and one wanting to go left. Uh, you can't have that, it won't work. And uh, it's, one has to learn from the other and keep in step with the other for it to work. It can't work any other way. You can't have even two your horses yoked up together with one walking and the other trotting. One will have to learn of the other. And uh, so Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. The first and foremost thing that we need to learn about our Saviour Jesus Christ is that he is God manifest in the flesh. The fact that uh, this is even a controversial issue these days uh, absolutely amazes me. You know, for some reason, since the late, 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 uh, probably the late, um, sorry, the eight, late 1800s, this has become a controversial issue uh, with the 
rise of the Jehovah's Witnesses and, and organisations like that. And, uh, but any Jesus that died on a cross who is not God manifest in the flesh is another Jesus. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. Only God manifest in the flesh can make the atonement for sin. A man can't do it, a prophet can't do it, and even an angel cannot do it. It must be God that does it. It has to be the perfect, spotless Lamb of God to atone for sin. So the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3.16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. I mean, that verse alone should just knock it on the head, you know, for all those uh, that want to make this a controversial issue, you know, because my Bible says it's without controversy. So it means that if controversy is over here, well, this is over here. It's, it's without controversy. It's not even co near controversy. It's not a controversial thing. You know, but there are Christians today that are accepting uh, these groups, such as the Jehovah's Witness, just, of, just as another, uh, another branch of Christianity or another branch of their own. And you know, they say things like, you know, we don't agree with them on everything, uh, but, you know, uh, you know, it's, you know, but they still believe in Jesus, they say. You know, but I say no, they don't believe in Jesus because it's not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible was God manifest in the flesh. And uh, the Bible says that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And I reckon that's a whole bucket load of leaven. It's a bucket load of leaven. And, uh, you know, they say things like, and I hear this from Muslims too on the street uh, a lot, you know, when you're out there witnessing. You know, they say, why would uh, God Almighty, you know, lower himself to our level and uh, be like one of us? You know, they say, if you think that's who God is, then you have a, uh, a low view uh, of God. You, know, don't, you don't have a high view of God. But I don't think uh, that's the case. You know, and it doesn't change my high view of him at all. You know, actually, it enhances it. It shows me how great God is, that the almighty God would manifest himself in the flesh and come as a man and put on flesh and die for sinners. I mean, that's my high God. I hope it's yours today. Amen. That blows me away, that we can be forgiven by God himself, who put on flesh, God the Son. And that's exactly what my Bible says he did. Says, says he did. Philippians 2, 4 to 11 says, look not on every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross." Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So this is why Jesus can say, Learn of me, for I am meek, and lowly in heart. He made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a servant, made in the likeness of man. He humbled himself in this way. And that's my almighty God. That's my almighty God, and I hope that's who he is to you today. I hope that's who Jesus is to you. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment 
and with justice from henceforth for even forever. And look at this, and the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And he has. He has performed it. But when you think about that, what a list of names our Saviour has. Wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And yet he humbled himself and came into the world as one of us, without sin, to atone for our sin. For me, that brings rest unto my soul. For, the, for me, that brings rest unto my soul, that I'm, I can be forgiven of my sin. Jesus says in verse 28 of our passage, he says, Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. So when you think about Jesus' audience here, being the Israelites uh, who he uh, spoke these words to, you know, uh, they should have realised that this was their promised Messiah. So they're hearing these words from Jesus and they should have realised that it was their promised Messiah. They were under the yoke of the Roman Empire at this time. Now their burdens were very heavy. Uh, they were also under the Pharisaic law of the day which added uh, so much more than God actually required of them. Now they had the law of Moses and then the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes loaded all these other things on top of the, the law, you know, the washing of cups and this and that and everything. And they were, they were under the yoke of that as well. Matthew 23, 2 to 4, Jesus says this about, about them. He says, The scribes and the Pharisees sit at Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them upon men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. This is how they were. They would load them up with all these extra laws that, they, that God didn't even require them to do, and they wouldn't even lift one little finger to help these people. But they should have recognised their Messiah. They had the prophecies that foretold of the coming of their Messiah. Genesis 22, 16 to 18. It started when Abraham was told uh, by the Lord to offer his only begotten son Isaac as a sacrifice uh, on the altar. But then God stepped in and he provided himself a lamb instead. You know, the Lord speaking to Abraham, he said, and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Look at verse 18, it says, And, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Galatians 3.16 says, Now Abraham and, and, he, and to his seed were the promise, and to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, and he saith not, and to seeds, with an S, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So it was predicted all the way back then about the coming of Christ. They had it in their scriptures. Uh, his lineage, Jesus' lineage was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 11, 1 to 2, and there shall come forth a rod out of the uh, stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit uh, of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Jesus' uh, lineage traces right back to David, uh, to David's father, Jesse, and uh, Isaiah, he prophesied that. The prophet Jeremiah prophesied Jesus' coming as well. Uh, in Jeremiah 23, 5 to 6, uh, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice on the earth. And in his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteous. 
See, there's only one person uh, that's worthy of that name or that title, and that's Jesus Christ, and that's God manifest in the flesh. Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7:14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. That name Emmanuel means God with us. The prophet Micah prophesied of the place of Jesus' birth. Micah 5.2, it says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is, to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. See, Jesus' lineage can be traced back through the line of David, uh, back to the tribe of Judah. It was all there, written down uh, in Israel's scriptures. It's written down in our Old Testament. They, they've still got the Old Testament. They still hold to the Old Testament, even though they've added uh, all their other laws and all these things. It's there for them to see. Even what Jesus would do and say was prophesied. Isaiah 35, 3 to 6. We read, Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong. Fear not, behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God, with a recompense, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be un unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart and the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Uh, these are the types of things that Israel should have been looking for uh, in their coming Messiah. Isaiah even prophesied of the suffering of Jesus. He prof prophesied of the suffering Saviour. Isaiah 53, <coughs> verses 1 to 5. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when, when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we did hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So all these signs uh, were what the people in Jesus' day, specifically the Israelites, should have been looking for in their saviour. Some saw it, some saw it, but the majority missed it. 1 John 1.11 Sorry, John 1.11 says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. So did the majority miss it because they didn't know? Did they miss it because they were uneducated? No, they missed it because they didn't see their need to come to Jesus. They trusted in their own self-righteousness, in their own self-dependence, they wanted things their own way. They didn't want to yoke up with God the Father and learn to learn of God the Son. They didn't want to learn of God manifest in the flesh. Jesus said in John 6, 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall, all, they shall be all taught of God. And every man therefore that hath heard and have learned of the Father cometh unto me. If they had have learned of the Father and listened, they would have come to Jesus. They had their chance to recognise Jesus when he came, but they chose to carry their own burdens and yoke up the Pharisees instead. If they had listened and learned of God the Father, they would have recognised his voice. They would have recognised the voice of God and God the Son. The unbelieving Jews that had not listened and learned of the Father at this point uh, were in a process of being uh, judicially hardened or judicially blinded because of their unbelief and their sin and their rejection of God's provision for their salvation. They were trusting in their own ways, their own righteousness, instead of their own uh, 
instead of uh, the one that brings salvation, instead of God the Father who told how salvation would come. They were trusting in their law, they were trusting in their obedience to the law. They didn't understand uh, what the law was meant to do, which was to bring them to Christ. And uh, they didn't understand that Christ gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And that due time was about to be, be fulfilled when Jesus went to the cross to be crucified. One man described a judicial blindness or a hardening like this. He says, God simply lets them continue down uh, their already uh, contra causally free self-hardened path and make sure no revelation convinces them to repent prior to his redemptive purposes being uh, carried out. And this is where the majority of Israel were at, at this stage. They had rejected uh, their prophets. They had rejected uh, the uh, prophecies of Christ. They weren't ready for his coming. So they were, going, they were in this process of being judicially blinded that they would even put their own saviour on the cross. The ones that should have been ready, the ones that should have had more revelation than anybody else, and they did, the ones that caused such deep sorrow for the Apostle Paul. And he said this in Romans 9, 1 to 5. He loved his own people. He loved his own people, but he said this in Romans 9, 1 to 5. He says, I say the truth in Christ. I lie, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. He says, for I wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are the Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever, amen. This is uh, Paul's heartfelt sorrow for his own brethren, the Israelites that rejected their saviour uh, when he came. You know, they had all those benefits, and yet for the most part of them, and I'm not, I'm not saying all of them, but for the most part of them, they were not prepared for when Jesus came their Messiah. And as long as they were in this mindset of self-righteousness, they are judicially hardened to the truth of God. You know, the, the, the Bible describes it uh, like a veil over their eyes. The law of Moses was meant to uh, point them to Christ. It showed that they needed a saviour and that no one is righteous by keeping the law. The law shows us even today that no one is righteous by keeping God's laws. If it is, then we've all failed, every single one of us. And we're all on our way to hell if that's the case. There's nothing wrong with the laws of God. There was nothing, nothing wrong with the laws of God back then, just as there's nothing wrong with the laws of God now. You now, we should uh, continue to keep doing what God wants us to do. And there's actually a problem if you don't. If you don't have a desire to want to live for the Lord, there is a problem. You know, I love coming to church. I love it. I really do. I love coming to church. But I'm not justified by coming to church. I'm not justified by that. I'm justified by the blood of Jesus. Amen. That's the reason I come to church. It's because I'm justified by the blood of Jesus and I just love living for the Lord. And, uh, you know, because I love God. I love God and what he's done for me. Therefore, I love doing what he wants me to do. But I love the saints of God. I love the people of God. I love being around uh, like-minded believers. I love it. You know, but there's a problem if you don't. There's a problem if you don't. But there's also a problem if you come just because I've got to tick that box. You know, and, and that's going to justify you. No, you're justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. 
And that should cause you to want to come to church and be in fellowship with the brethren. That's, that's what it drives me to do anyway. I love being yoked up together with Jesus and learning of him. I love being yoked up with like-minded believers. I really do. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4 uh, he even called one of his companions, and uh, he was probably referring to Epaphroditus uh, here, he called him a, a true yoke fellow. A true yoke fellow. Now, I love being prepared to meet Jesus. I love being prepared to meet him. I know I'm going to meet him face to face one day. Because when you think about it, the majority of Israelites were not prepared to meet Jesus the first time. They weren't prepared to meet him the first time he came. And there are many today who are not prepared to meet Jesus the second time. The second time. He's coming again. Now, did it grieve Jesus that they weren't prepared? Did it grieve him that they were not prepared to meet him? He was. It grieved him. Matthew 23, uh, sorry, it's uh, Luke 19 41 to 44, he says, And when he was come near, speaking about Jerusalem here, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round, round and keep thee on every side and shall lay thee even with, with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not of the time of thy visitation. See, Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD and the people were scattered throughout all the earth. And it's not until uh, recent times that Israel has come back on the map again since that time. You know, the Lord uh, has still got some unfinished business to do in Israel. I believe that from what I read in the scriptures. And I reckon we're getting very close to that time. Until then, the ones that have that same mindset still have a veil over their eyes while they reject their saviour. But with a veil, it doesn't mean that you can't see. It means that you can't see very well because there's something uh, obstructing your view. You know, the obstruction needs to be removed so you can really see what's going on. And the only way that the veil can be removed from them is if they come to Jesus Christ and then it will be removed. They must stop trusting in righteousness by the law of Moses and trust in righteousness that is only through Jesus Christ. And that's what the law of Moses was meant to point them to. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, 11 to 16 says, For if that which is done away was glorious, talking about the law of Moses, much more that which remaineth is glorious, speaking of Christ and the gospel. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of, what, of that which is abolished. So when Moses came down from Mount Sinai uh, the second time with the Ten Commandments, his face shone so bright uh, that the Is Israelites were afraid to even uh, come near to him. And uh, Moses, he had to put this veil over his face when he spoke to them. It was a, a type uh, or an example of how the majority of the Israelites would, would be. <coughs> Paul is saying in the same way they couldn't look at the bright shining uh, face of Moses, of Moses, sorry, the majority also couldn't see the end of that which is abolished. It was a type. You know, it was almost a prophecy of what was to come. So God knows all things. He knows the future. They couldn't see that the law pointed to the Saviour. But their minds were blinded, it says in verse 14. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. Look at this, which veil is done away in Christ. 
But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. See, there's the key to having the veil removed. They must humbly come to Christ and have it removed. Until then, the veil is upon their heart. And there's going to be no rest, no rest for any soul if they don't come to Jesus. See, the unbelieving Jews will still have to carry the heavy burden of their law because the law can never take away sin. The unbelieving Gentile, that's everyone else, apart from if you're not an Israel, Israelite or a Jew, will have to carry the heavy burden of their sin because no one can ever live up to the law. The only way for Jew or Gentile to, is to come to Christ to have your sins forgiven and yoke up with Jesus and learn of him. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But Look back here at Matthew chapter 11. <coughs> See, Jesus had just been throughout the cities of his own people, fulfilling prophecy, doing all the mighty works that had been prophesied uh, that he would do, healing the blind, making the lame walk again, performing all the miracles to authenticate who he was to his own people, the promised Messiah, the things that were written about him. But they still didn't believe. Look there at verse 16 in Matthew chapter 11. It says, But whereunto, Jesus says, shall I like liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows, and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and you have not lamented. All these mighty works, and the majority just didn't care. It didn't matter what Jesus did, they were just cold-hearted. It's like the kids in the marketplace that won't dance to the pipe of their fellows. That's what Jesus is saying. And it's like the kids that have no emotion when one kid falls over and, and hurts himself. They just keep playing. They just, just didn't care. Didn't matter what Jesus did, they were just not going to have him. Verse 18, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he hath a devil. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, behold, a man gluttonous and a winebibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. So eating or drinking, not eating or drinking, it wouldn't matter. They still falsely called Jesus a glutton and a winebibber and a friend or a cohort with sinners. So even if Jesus had eaten, you know, just locusts and wild honey like John the Baptist, they would have said he had a devil. So it didn't matter what he did. Verse 20, Then, he, then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. 21, woe unto thee, Shirazan, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, these are cities that are in Israel, which are exalted unto heaven, Shall be, uh, which art exalted unto heaven shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Think about that. More tolerable in the land of Sodom. Now Sodom was so wicked that the Lord rained brimstone of fire from heaven and absolutely destroyed it off the face of this earth. So Israel knew better than Sodom. It's not that Sodom were more righteous than Israel, they were both unrighteous, but Israel out of any nation should have been prepared to meet their saviour. But there was always a faithful remnant 
always a faithful remnant. But for the most part of Israel, at this time in their history, they had shut their eyes and they had stopped their ears and they didn't want to know the truth. Jesus said about that generation in Matthew 23, 33, he says, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you the prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. And that's what happened. This is what happened. When the gospel was going out in the early church, they were persecuted by Israel more than any other nation. You know, some, some people might say, oh, you've got a problem with Israel. No, I love Israel. I love every nation. I've got the same heart as the Apostle Paul for Israel. He said that in Romans chapter 10. His heart is that all Israel would be saved. That's his heart. And uh, that's the heart we should have for every nation, every person in every nation. Look at this, 35, he says, that upon you may come all the righteous blood uh, shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom he slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Look what Jesus says here. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them, which is sent unto, you, unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. He says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, for I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, Jesus says, till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. See, God takes it seriously when you know the truth, and maybe even more so than the next person, and yet you still continually reject it and reject it and reject it. And you've got all the revelation that you need. It's in Matthew chapter uh, 13, Jesus uh, said to his own disciples, uh, who were part of the believing remnant, you know, his, his disciples were Israelites too. And Jesus was uh, speaking in parables in such a way that if you had ears to hear and your heart wasn't already waxed over or, or cold and you'd listened and learned to the Father, uh, then you would understand. But to those that had rejected the truth time and time and time and time again, they were being judicially blinded even further to fulfil prophecy and even to the point of uh, being complicit complicit in uh, crucifying their saviour. But look at verse 9 in Matthew chapter 13. You know, Jesus, uh, he declared this after telling the people the, the people the parable of the sower. He says in uh, verse 9, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and he said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but unto them it is not given. He says, For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he hath. So if you've got ears to hear, that want to listen, well, you'll be given more in abundance. That's what he's saying here. But if you have ears to that hear, but don't want to listen, then even the little that you have will be taken away. That's what Jesus is saying. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. Look at this, for this people's heart is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. See, it's not that Jesus didn't want them to be saved. 
It's just that they needed to see their need. They needed to see with their eyes, but they had eyes to see. They needed to hear with their ears, but they had ears to hear. But here's what it was missing. They needed to understand with their heart and be converted. And Jesus says, and he would heal them. But they didn't want it. They were dull of hearing. They were dull of hearing. But look what he says in verse 16. He says, but blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. And that brings us back to the context of Matthew chapter 11, so we can understand why Jesus said the next thing that he said. So this is just after saying that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in that day of judgment than for thee. Thee being the cities of Israel that Jesus had just been through uh, doing these mighty works. Look at verse uh, 25 in Matthew chapter 11. At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Well, what things? What things is Jesus talking about here? Well, the understanding of his parables. You know, revealing who he really was, like he did with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Remember, she came humbly. She was a sinner. She was looking for the Saviour, but she needed saving. She was looking for the second coming of the Messiah. And like he did with Peter, James and John in Matthew chapter 17 when they saw the glory of Jesus when he was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. Or even like the Gentiles. See, I'm a Gentile. Acts 28, 28, the Apostle Paul says to the Jews after they had again rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ, he says, be it, therefore, be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles. And they will hear it. They will hear it. Albert Barnes puts it like this. He says, hid these things from the wise and prudent, that is, from those who thought themselves wise, wise according to the world's estimation of wisdom and has revealed them unto babes. He says, to the poor, the ignorant, the obscure, the teachable, the simple, the humble. He says, by the wise and prudent here, he had reference probably to the proud and haughty scribes and Pharisees in Capernaum. They rejected his gospel, but it was the pleasure of God to reveal it to obscure and more humble people. The reason given, only the satisfactory reason, he says, is that it seems so good in the sight of God. Look at verse 27 of Matthew, chapter 11. Jesus says, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So the scribes and the Pharisees prided themselves in knowing God the Father. Oh, if anyone knows God the Father, well, we do. You know, we're scribes, we're Pharisees, you know. You know, little did they realise access had actually been taken away from them. Their only hope of any access now is to come through God the Son, to come through Jesus Christ. That brings us back to our passage where Jesus breaks out into this heartfelt invitation where he says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, he says, Come unto me. All ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's a call to everybody. That's a call. Nothing can bring you rest like yoking up with Jesus. That doesn't mean that you won't have to carry any burden. It doesn't mean that, because when you're under the yoke, there's a burden. But the burden will be light. 
The yoke will be easy because you're with Jesus. It doesn't even mean that you won't be persecuted for yoking up with Jesus. But he'll carry you through it because you're yoked up with Jesus. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. The Apostle said this in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. And the Apostle Paul went through a lot of persecution. He says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Look at this. He says, For our light affliction, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us, worketh for us <coughs> look at this, a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So there's an eternal weight of glory coming for all those who yoke up with Jesus. So much glory that you can't even carry it. And there's enough for everybody. The affliction that you may have to encounter in this life for the cause of Christ will seem like a light affliction in view of eternity. When you're looking into eternity, that goes on for a long time. What you have to endure for the cause of Christ will be a light affliction. But you must be yoked up with Jesus. You must take Jesus' yoke upon you. I'd rather be yoked up with Jesus any day than yoked up with the world and its ungodly pleasures and its heavy burdens. So that's what they are. So when I'm yoked up with Jesus, I learn of his ways. It's much better. It's much better. Actually, just two chapters later in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 to 18. He says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? What concord has Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, and as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and will be the, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you. You shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. There's nothing wrong with being a friend to unbelievers, but an unbeliever is still an unbeliever, and you want him uh, to be a believer. You want to win them to the Lord. That's what you want to do. You know, uh, you want them to repent and be saved too. I'm not saying you don't have a heart for unbelieving. You can be a friend to unbelievers, absolutely. But you don't yoke up together with them. That's what Paul was saying. You will learn their ways. They won't learn yours if you yoke up together with them. You cannot be yoked up together with someone who does not believe that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. You can't be yoked up together with somebody who wants to live a life of sin. Even if they call themselves a Christian. Because you'll come under their yoke. They'll start teaching you their ways. Jesus said in Matthew uh, chapter 16, 24 to 26, he says, Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. He says, For what is, a, what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Look at this. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So if you're yoked up with Jesus, you're going to definitely lose, start to lose some things. But those weighty things that weighed you down in your old life, those things that weighed me down in my old life, I've found out that I don't need them anymore. And that's what you'll find. What would you give in exchange for your soul? What are you willing to carry? What heavy burden are you willing to carry to give in exchange for your soul? 
The Bible says in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 11, that there's going to be no rest for the soul that refuses to yoke up with Jesus. It says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. No rest day or night. But Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The invitation was there for all of Israel. The invitation is there for every Gentile. Remember, that's anybody that's apart from Israel. They weren't ready. The majority of them weren't ready for their saviour when he came. They were, had this judicial hardening put upon them uh, so that God could fulfil his purposes. And uh, he came unto his own, but his own received him not. They were the ones yelling, crucify him, crucify him. But the invitation is there for all people to come to Jesus to take his yoke upon you, learn of him. He's meek, he's lowly in heart. He gave himself a ransom for all. And you shall find rest unto your souls. What will you give in exchange for your soul? Jesus wants to take that burden of sin away. That burden of sin, it's heavy. It's a heavy burden, but it can only be done through faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on that cross to save people from their sin. His burden, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. You just need to come to Jesus to find that out. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.